We're dealing with the same content that I've spoken about before in my other work, but we're looking at it in a slightly different way. You know, I mean, the painter Cezanne, you know, painted dozens and dozens of the same mountain in different light. You know, Monet did it with a single tree. He painted the same tree, you know, literally dozens of times, and it was a different tree because the light was different and the complexion was different. And when we're talking about this great mystery of conspiracy and what's been going on in the world, the person who's studying that needs to be like that. They need to have that kind of an eye where they examine it, they walk around it, they see it from all sides. They don't get fixated on a particular you know, prejudicial uh, understanding. They keep reviewing it, keep pulling it out again. Look at it under a different light. Look at it under a different perspective. There's many ways to look at this particular you know, creature because it's fascinating. And the establishment figures, they hide themselves. Their agenda is not open. It's, you know, they sort of, I always describe them as tigers in the long grass. And therefore, you need to track them. And that has, often has to be done by night. And you have to get very aware of their weaponry and what kind of, you know, abilities that they have. Because they've been studying us, you see. And well, what they do they want, Michael? This. What do they want? Well, first and foremost, they want this identification. When, when they, remember, because you really can't force everyone into control of shackles by gunpoint. It's much better to work on them psychologically so that you have their identification. And the working for the human being, or, you know, weakening him so he's not tied into his own selfhood, then we lean on the handrails that are provided by these big fatherly figures, you know, and that's what basically they're up to. Because once you have that complicity, and see, as I said in the beginning, man maybe doesn't want freedom. Maybe he's never had it. And maybe, you know something even worse? Maybe he doesn't even really want it. Maybe what he wants is freedom from freedom. Maybe what he wants is sort of like a decorated and furnished incarceration. And the leaders operate on that level. They go, listen, we know you're anxious, we know you got problems, but we're here to hand you technologies and virtual realities and cyber purgatories and all sorts of bells and whistles to make your incarceration, you know, uh, eventful. And the same thing is the way they present this global village. They're always insinuating that man is imperfect, he needs to be fixed, you know, and I've always described these people as sort of that's, that's the psychopath. The psychopath cannot see the hierarchy. He can only see the hierarchy. That's why they use hierarchical models as their symbols, like, for instance, the pyramid. That's because that is the very symbol, the very emblem of the psychopath who cannot see the wholeness. He cannot see the perfection. He wants to put earrings on the Mona Lisa. He wants to fix what isn't broken. And this is what we're looking at right now in this particular series, uh, as well as the fact of how this identification takes place. And how, because of an age-old trauma, the human race right now is becoming as alien, or in other words, dehumanized, as his creators. He's actually identifying with them to the point that his own humanity is actually, you know, he's tiring of his own humanity. And this, this is a fascinating uh, study. We're actually looking at, wait a minute, what is it that we are doing? Because we are the many, they are the few. What is it that we are doing to land ourselves to any kind of tyranny, whatever it is, that this has not been normally done before in this uh, movement of the alternative research movement, you know? And it's time that we started looking at it, we've been doing it, and we've been getting great responses from people, you know, who are starting to get around this paradigm. Obviously, we look around at the people today and we see this vacancy. We totally see this complicity. We see them egging it on. We see them voting it in. Uh, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote three massive books on the Gulag, and one of the things he emphasized constantly is how hundreds of thousands of prisoners were controlled by, you know, nothing more than a dozen guards, and were even marched to their death, and all other sorts of terrible, terrible injustices were taking place up in, you know, Siberia during the communist period. And he could never understand how they, people just moved around like sheep, taking these orders, when they easily could have overpowered the guards. And that complicity is the colonialized mind. That is the result of the war on consciousness. And unless people like myself, teachers, point this out, how this dynamic works and how people lend themselves to this, you know, we won't have the tools to discover how this works. The power is psychology, because the leaders are up on that. They are it's absolutely be, It's going to be very interesting, Mike. And because people have been leaving consciousness at the door, they haven't studied it correctly, they, therefore, do not have the manual to fix the problems that are. We know that there are these problems. But if you keep going to the false teachers or the wrong teachers and the, the wrong teachings, in my opinion, you know, don't, then don't expect things to ever change. It's as simple as that. The secrets of all that's happening in the external world, and I mean all of it, everything that happens in society, and you don't need to be Wilhelm Reich to work this out, that consciousness affects matter and consciousness affects society. 
Hitlers and people like that are voted in. All forms of tyranny are a manifestation of what's going on in the temperament of the human psyche. And, you know, I'm not the first to have said this, but certainly within the conspiracy movement, we need to revamp this idea and get around this instead of stop pointing fingers. And also, what, what, I, what do I mean by pointing fingers? I mean, stop dilly-dallying in the political game. In other words, fighting this giant, fighting this Goliath with the weapons that the Goliath has provided for you, namely the political arena, in which you may have a certain amount of topical, you know, uh, developments and a bit of progress, but it's completely useless. It doesn't bring down, you know, the establishments of control. It doesn't affect the major architecture of control. They've handed us the, the weaponry, so-called, to fight them. And we have to be suspect of that. It Michael, hasn't achieved these, anything these in the people, past, and it won't achieve anything in the future. These people, though, are brilliant. They have learned how to break people down. I mean, right now, most people are concerned about their jobs and yeah. their income and paying a house payment or, you know, taking care of their families. That's what they're afraid of right now. That's what they're petrified of. And they have learned how to break that person down, how to cripple him, and how to make him so afraid that they can manipulate him and tell him to do anything they want. And that's what's happening. And let's, and let's never uh, forget how old that game is, you know, through hook or by crook. They, you know, they use the double-headed eagle. This is a situation in which either they're going to be controlled by monarchy or by theocracy. And the theocracy is better because it works on the emotions of man. It ties back into what I'm saying about the inner complexes that people have they done 10, 15 years before. Pulled a rug from er under everybody, upset everybody, you know, with these fake crises that are actually manufactured. If anyone doesn't know that, they need to know it, that all these economic catastrophes are purely engineered, and they're engineered for a reason, and that is to bring people down to a repressed and, you know, create these artificial recessions, which they've done throughout the millennia, throughout the decades. And then that sets people up, you see, to be, again, just like it was back in the 80s, very materialistic, very uh, narcissistic, very focused on their own personal welfare in a very greedy and selfish way. There will be a new overclass, you see. Of course, the richer will always get richer. Of but what course. they're hoping for now, they want, in the meantime, what they're doing is they want a lot of people to drop through the net. And unfortunately, the people who are getting the most anxious and the people who are getting very trepidatious, they are the victims. They are the ones who do not see the big picture. They don't understand what's happening. They're like tasered. And so they will fall through the cracks in exactly the same way as what happened back in 1939 with the so-called faux depression that was, art, you know, that was uh, manufactured for people. To erase one set of the working class so that a new technic class can come through. If you look at what I'm saying, you'll even realize that the Silicon Revolution of the 80s is actually just the, that was just the hors d'oeuvre. The new boom is to come, and the new boom will have a different kind of decadence connected to it. It will have good things as well as bad, but it's all engineered. And you always know this because a few years before, they upset everything and put people into complete meltdown, both psychologically and fin financially, you see, in order to clear the way for the next program that they're going to unleash. And that we saw this in the Bay Area. We examined the situation, and we've seen it. And it might, you might as well refer to it as the green silicon revolution that's coming. It ties into the whole big agenda from higher up. Well, if you want to catch a fish, Michael, you don't reel it in really fast. You do it in a very nice, methodical manner, and that's what they're doing to people. Well said. How do we deprogram ourselves? How do we fight the control? What do we do? Um, go to the right teachers. And for me, that's always the Youngs and the Freuds and the you know Wilhelm Reichs and even the Ayn Rams. Go to the right kinds of teachers. That doesn't mean believe everything they say. That doesn't mean that they're right. But we need to look at man as the individual of who he really is in, in sort of a distinction, you know, from his role, from all of the things that he's bought into, because as you said earlier on, he's concerned about his security. And that's fine. We're not saying leave the roles. We're just real, saying realize you're in those roles, but you are something else. You're a dharmic being. You are, you are a potential light worker. You know, you are a potential uh, master of your own life. You're a priest and priestess of your own existence. Start looking into that. Feel the confidence. Find your selfhood again. Stop making other people dependent on you and stop becoming dependent on others. Examine the anxiety. You talked earlier on about the tremendous level of fear that exists in the world. Well, there's fear. That's from external things. And then there's anxiety, which is a man's in about his own nature, his own being. And as we said, because of this colonizing power of monarchy and, and autocracy, you know, man has been shaken to the foundations. He's a mutilated his psyche is mutilated. 
So he needs to start looking back. In, you know, we all know we got two legs, two arms, and a head. Anyone can tell you the anatomy of the physical body. What is the anatomy of thinking? What is thought? Who's thinking about thought? You know, you there's know, a whole anatomy of the mind. There's a whole anatomy of consciousness that needs Michael, to be, again, reviewed. 